the book stops where or follow the almighty dollar. This essay was dated February 19, 2010. The professor was Dr. Jim Walshide, or however that's your name, in Economics 2803, Principle of Macroeconomics. The assignment was to read a blog by textbook author Greg Nanhew. His blog is gregnanhew.blogspot.com. At this point, I'd have to say I'm not altogether particularly fond of Dr. Nanhew. He is, of late, proven himself to be politically partisan in his outlook, clearly blaming the Democrats for our current economic downturn while completely exonerating the Republicans. And with little wonder, one does not have to read a great number of his blogs to find out that he touts himself as being an economic advisor of George W. Bush. And it gives him about as much credibility as someone who claimed to be W.'s international policy advisor. In his article, What's Sustainable About This Budget, Mankiw rejects the idea of a balanced budget, saying that there is nothing wrong with having a small amount of national deficit. But isn't that the type of thinking that got us into this god-awful economic mess to begin with? Are we simply surfing the waves of social economic turmoil at the expense of future generations that will eventually have to pay for it? By this I mean that we are borrowing money for government spending, as in bailout money that goes directly into the pockets of the very business ex executives that ran the firms into the ground in the first place. We are borrowing this money from ourselves, our own taxpayer, with no real valuable means to pay for it. We have failed to learn the lesson of the housing market bubble, and that most people live blissfully under the assumption that their lovely little house will only increase in value. So they borrowed against this assumed value in the form of the second or third mortgages. It was a gamble, and a greedy one at that, and the bubble burst with the housing market decreasing instead of increasing like it was expected to. So now, in order to survive this current economic depression, we are creating what I see to be a government spending bubble, a vast increase in government spending based upon the assumption that the economy will improve. But I say the economy is only going to get worse. Much, much worse. And even when we start to turn the economy around, even when it appeared to be an improvement, in the end, we are going to be worse off than we were before. Just a bit of warning for you economic professors. Don't ever let your students read George Orwell while taking an economics course. His book 1984 is practically screaming at me. Give people false information, in, the, in this case in the form of budget plans or GDP reports, that make it appear as if the economy is recovering, when all we're really doing is moving money around from one area to another, with no real improvement anywhere at all. Make a sacrifice for Big Brother. The chocolate ration will be decreased to 20 grams a week. And the cycle only gets worse. Mankiw has, was correct to suggest that war depression has an adverse effect on the, on the economy. War increases spending, which we will have to pay for eventually, whereas depression reduces the amount of money available to pay for that spending. But he seems to apply that war is declining and the economy is improving. Where is he getting this information? We love Big Brother. The chocolate ration will be increased to 10 grams a week. The war is by no means at all whatsoever declining. We are not pulling troops out of Iraq, at least by any sizable amount, and those who are being pulled out of Iraq are being sent to Afghanistan. Note that this was written a year ago. After Obama pulled the combat troops out of Iraq, we still have soldiers deployed to two different war zones, with no significant decrease in government spending. Port for me, I saw it coming a year ago. Add to those deployments this mess going on in Haiti. Remember, this was a year ago. Military members consider such humanitarian missions a point of honor, and just as important as combat missions, so no sensible military commander would advise pulling troops out of Haiti. Meanwhile, all of the established big builder propaganda has been dropping hints about Iran for at least the past two or three years. Mark my words, eventually diplomacy 
will fail and they may use different phrases and we will find ourselves in a nuclear standoff with Iran which at the end of the day may in fact have as bad as many WMDs as Iraq. In fact, I'll bet you an almighty dollar will, that we will be at, at war with either Iran or North Korea by the time I graduate from UAFS. Oceania is, is at war with East Asia. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. And how will we pay for this massive upsurge of military deployments? But well, we certainly won't pay for it with a reduction of government spending. In fact, there will be an increase in spending as we will increase the size of the military. We will increase the size of the military by going against what everything that military commanders have hitherto for been promising us. We will in reinstitute the draft and military service will then become compulsory. Yet, although we will then have a drastic increase in the size of the military, this will not be compensated by a decrease in the pay of military personnel. Military pay, or any federal government pay for that matter, will never decrease. The closest thing that we will see to a decrease in military pay will be a disinclination to increase the pay. Normally, a pay increase of 1 to 2% per fiscal year is fairly standard as far as military pay is concerned. Ergo, the closest that we come to military pay decrease will be an increase of 0%, same pay as the previous fiscal year, and no budget for reenlistment bonuses. On an interesting side note, we will see the principle of future expectations of price in regards to military reenlistments. Typically, if a service member is eligible for a bonus, then the money offered is almost always zero up to the beginning of the new fiscal year, which falls on October 1st. At the time, the military is authorized to offer enlistment bonuses while they still have the money in the budget. So service members who would not receive a bonus in any case will re-enlist sometime in the middle of the fiscal year, as it would not matter either way. A person with a high re-enlistment bonus, such as electronic technician, will wait until October or November. And this explains why I re-enlisted on November 22nd. This is actually relatively late as I waited until the historical port visit to Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Oceania is allied with East Asia. Oceania is at war with Eurasia. Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia. So while well, about a million draftees are being killed in action in the quadruple front war in Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, and North Korea, with a small but well-established military installation in Port au Prince, complete with an army exchange gym, food court, and swimming pool, our internal infrastructure will continue to crumble. The stimulus money that was allegedly supposed to go to help rebuild roads and buildings and bridges and prisons in Mexico will actually still be where it has been since Obama first authorized it. Finding the pockets of a few corporate fat cats who then fill out false reports but all the jobs that they're creating, saving, paying higher, higher wages for in an entirely fictional congressional district. While their counterpart fat cats in D.C. are patting themselves on the back for another job exceptionally well done. Or willing in society indeed. Only about 24 years off from what he expected. New financial reports from the Ministry of Plenty state that 25 jobs were saved in a shoelace factory in the 237 Congressional District of Arkansas. And so, even now, people find themselves jobless, homeless, and hopeless. Some find solace in government-subsidized education, but it's only a matter of time before the send an unemployed people to college budget will be exhausted. Meanwhile, the economy will keep getting worse while the Harvard-educated economists continuously try to get their old advisory positions back. Now, in my last paper, which was permeated with questions about health care, you stated, that is, my professor stated, that I needed to find some more conclusions. Well, I don't have any, at least not none that people want to hear. Because from a truly pragmatic standpoint, the only real truthful message that people need to know is that the economy is bad. And the economy is going to get worse, much worse. The economy is not going to improve anytime soon. Years from now, foreclosed homes will continue to stand empty, 
mostly because socially minded individuals will not want to live in homes that they know were unfairly wrested from the hands of the previous owners. Businesses will still be boarded up. There will be no money available to improve the infrastructure. There will be more disasters as levees fail and bridges collapse, because even though there will be enough unemployed people to make the repairs, there will be no money to pay them. Yet ironically, unemployment itself will fall dramatically. Most of the employable individuals will be drafted and sent to Iran. America is at war with Iran. America has always been at war with Iran. The ration of Pepsi has been increased to two cans per week. I love Big Brother. Stand by for the two minutes hate. Like it or love it, the one and only thing that will ultimately turn our economy around will be the willingness of people in our society to work hard, educate themselves, and to improve their productivity. This requires creativity, ingenuity, and dedication to ourselves and the improvement of society around us. Above all, it will take a willingness to accept the harsh, abject risk of utter failure. This is a principle that I think most people in our society have forgotten. The greater the risk of failure, the sweeter the ultimate success. We need to be courageous enough to accept the possibility of failure, and yet strive to succeed in spite of the overwhelming odds. I think that far too many people want to guarantee success, but in reality, there are none. A real leader is one who is willing to fail over and over and over again until he ultimately prevails. You tried, you failed. You get back up and life knocked you back down again. So you get up again. You attacked and life defended. So you counter attack from a different angle. You run, get tired, stop, rest, get back up again and keep running. Insert other allegory here. God favors the bold and brave of heart. General Alexander A. Vandergrift, United States Marine Corps, Medal of Honor recipient, August 7th, 1942.